but you see a, a generational shift where all of a sudden uh, an older generation gets a sense of what you know the 15 year old's been swimming in right I mean, they <laughs> swim in that constantly and they were doing that before a month ago right yep. so do you see some of that? Do you see some sparks kind of popping? Oh up yeah, yeah. I, th I think you're right. There's there's sparks uh, sparks all around, and the question is where do the where do the flames actually build up? But what I I think is happening. Think about it in this basic way. Um, for most of us who are more than 24, uh, so we're not digital natives. We're digital immigrants. For most of us we're always offline unless we're on. Yep. But if you're less than 24, they're always online unless they're off. Mm -hmm. And for the XR natives, those say 15 or less, those that got the Oculus uh, Quest uh, for Christmas, uh, yep. that yep. was sold out, it was a Christmas gift, the first graceful, relatively inexpensive virtual reality medium yeah. The kids who got that for Christmas, they're always on unless they're off. And for them, this distinction, this choice between offline or being on state. So the choice of online shopping or in-store shopping, that sounds silly. We're going to be in that spectrum right. and i see i'm getting a message my internet connection is unstable so that's a fact of life for us are you still hearing me okay yeah we, you were good and you kind of carried through there oh good most of what you were saying about uh about the kind of differences between the generations as they're they're doing that but to yeah, your yeah. Point, right that uh, as we look at uh leadership for those who right now are framing the way we can think uh, future pandemics, other crisis, this is the way we're going to do it. And that it's going to be this real swim and mix uh, between these different, yeah. what we would see as different environments, but what the XR person generation sees as normative. Right, right, exactly. And we've got to figure out how to live in that blended reality world. Um, and it's, for most of today's leaders, they're great in person, but they degrade when they're not there physically. Yeah. And this situation with the virus, this is forcing us to figure out how we can be better. So for example, um, you know, my new book that you just talked about, yeah. um, this is the first time, this is my 12th book. This is the first time I've done a book release with no in-person interviews, no in-person <laughs> events, no bookstore signings, no none of that stuff that I normally do. But I can do things I can't do. So, for example, I'm I'm meeting you in my study here. So this is my study. I love to have books around me, but it's also got my exercise equipment. You know, I used to be a college basketball player, and I've got that side of my life up there in that wall, and I've got my exercise equipment tied in with my study. So what I'm offering now in a kind of master class around the new book is to invite people to come into my study and have a conversation with yeah. me. In, in my study, uh, and it can be a small group, it can be kind of like office hours back when I was a professor, uh, or it can be one-on-one, -on -one. but that's really different than if I'm on a keynote stage or if I'm doing something, and, it's, and it, it can be quite, quite personal. I mean, it, it, it's different, I'm, I'm not saying, but it's, but it's also, um, you know, people couldn't come inside my study, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's different, and it, yeah. it just has a different feel. Yeah, well, Malcolm Knight, I don't, he's a poet that I follow. Malcolm yeah. Knight, of course, is like stuck in his house, yep. and he's done the same thing. And he actually, he, so he's a poet, so he'll, so every once in a while, he invites everybody into the study. He nice. takes the book off, and he says, let's read this book and talk about this poem right here. I love it. Whatever. Yeah. Now, okay, Gabe, you got two old guys talking here. What are we missing in all of this? What do you <laughs> think, like, what do you, as you're kind of gauging this, how are you seeing it through your eyes? And, 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 and what, do you, what do you think that we, the two of us, like, aha, yeah, you're in your study. You're not even kidding me. Sorry, guys. Come on. What you know, you Andy, I, I will caveat that by saying that, um, you know, I, I know I present as young, but I don't feel so young. Uh, <laughs> This whole pandemic and being unable to go out and get a haircut, I've realized now that I counted. I have five gray hairs, and I'm going through a crisis right now. 
Um, I'm working with Bob, though. You never know. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know I, I look to the kids and I look to see what they do. And it's it's so incredible. Um, you, you know, I think before uh, there used to be a very real argument um, and with valid concerns and valid reasons behind it that, you know, kids who were gamers um, were wasting time that uh, they were being destructive to their future selves because they yeah. weren't socializing, they weren't going out, they didn't know how to communicate in, it, with people um, you know, in person. And now that we've all been forced into this virtual world and we can't go outside, we, we're, not, we're not supposed to, um, you know, we've had partners and clients at the Institute go back, come to us and say, listen, we're in the creative space or, or we're in the space of creating media. And before the mindset used to be that you had to be in the same room. And even if you had a creative genius sure. on the other side of the world, you couldn't rely on them right. because they had to be in the room. They had to be participating. And now they're starting to realize that themselves and their clients are being much more flexible. Yeah. Go back to when Fortnite was really at its height. When it first <laughs> took off. I mean, I, I have a younger brother who is uh, 17, 16, 17 in high school. And I would sit and I would just watch him play. I'd sit in the back of the room and I'd watch him play with his friends and folks around the world. And, you know, uh, they were doing teamwork. They, yep. There was a leader who was saying, hey, this is where we're landing on the map. This is the part of the game we're landing in. And you go out and you find resources and you build a perimeter and you, and of course I'm making this up because I don't know how Fortnite actually I works. Think it's I, I <laughs> threw myself into it. I, I tried. <laughs> but you know, they were doing teamwork. They were being creative. Yeah. There was a leader. There was there was order. There was structure. There were missions that they were trying to accomplish. And it's so easy to translate that now and say, how are people doing that with their day to day lives, with their day to day jobs now? Um, you know, what used to be seen as a waste of time, what used to be seen as anti productive, is now really the, the new norm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Well, and you know, it's fascinating to to we've. Uh, I'm a paper person, uh, and so I like to get the letter. I like to write on it, give it back to my admin. She and I have a whole new system of working, which depends yeah. on that teamwork and communication and how we're going to fight. So we've had to figure out our file system together and all of those kinds of things to run this organization offline. So it's a, no, I think you're exactly. Right about that, which which also brings up, um, how do you all, what do you think, you know, especially thinking around the full spectrum thinking. So we're all observing this, or many of us are experiencing it, not everybody, but many, especially in church leadership, are experiencing having to run organizations online like this. As you see that, what are the kinds of things that you we could do now? Like, as we're looking at this, what things do we need to um uh, think about intentionally that we may be seeing what would be uh, some actions we could take that they won't all be right of course right? right but but as you think about one of the engagement pieces about full spectrum is to to throw yourself in so what would be some things you think or or maybe examples of people you see throwing themselves in on yeah, well, things? yeah. A, couple of, a couple of specific things um, you know, I, my recommendation with watching the news nowadays is to fix, uh, pick a few sources and then limit your input per day because you, you can just overdose on it and you can uh, really lose all your sense of perspective. But there's a few, a few people I listen to very closely. Uh, but as you listen to them, uh, sort of listen for clarity and listen for certainty and try to categorize those and seek out the voices of clarity, avoid the voices of certainty. So just kind of do that sorting in your mind. For example, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, Anthony Fauci, uh, he's a voice of clarity. Deborah Birx, uh, the physician, uh, Bill Gates, you know, those are voices of clarity. But seek those people out, and those are the ones I would recommend that you listen to on a regular basis. Some of them are politicians that are clear, but right. not so. Uh, but, you know, be selective. And again, I, I don't talk about politics. I'm focused 10 years ahead. But I do filter for clarity versus certainty. The other thing, as Gabe was mentioning, look for signals and then share the signals. 
and interpret the signals with each other as you, you talk them through. And then pick out some principles that seem to work. Uh, the one that's coming out again and again in, in my work is this clarity versus certainty. Um, you know, there's a number of people listening to this who, who write sermons every week. There's a great sermon there <laughs> on, right. on clarity versus certainty. Yeah. There's a great sermon around full spectrum thinking. Full spectrum thinking is not new. Um, what's new is the tools for full spectrum thinking that are going to get dramatically better. Things like Gabe mentioned gameful engagement, things like big data analytics, like data visualization, like neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So we're learning more and more uh, about how to think in a full spectrum way, mm -hmm. how to avoid that tendency to categorize. And then the final thing I'd suggest is be mindful about how you react to new situations and try to resist judging too soon because that's the classic mistake of the problem solver. And most of what we see in a period like this are not problems you can solve. They're more like dilemmas, but also resist deciding too late. Um, and if you're not sure it's a problem or a dilemma, assume it's a dilemma because if you end up solving it, you get extra credit. But if you classify some as a problem and it turns out to be a dilemma, yeah. you're in a hole. Yeah. Um, so, so help sort out in your mind that right. difference between a problem you can solve and a dilemma you have to manage. And, you know, in a crisis, we do tend to compress our time frames, and we should, and, you know, solve the things you can solve. But these bigger looming dilemmas, those are the ones that are going to be necessary for us to play through over time. Right. It makes yeah. me think a little bit of uh, Epstein's work on range, yeah. you know, and how, yes. exactly. how, you're, you, how it, no longer exactly. can you do the one thing and be the right. specialist in the one. You may have some special skills in an area, but you're actually looking at some clarity among other professionals. That's right. Yeah, range and, and, you know, the... Uh, the psychologist Linda Stone talks about continuous partial attention and the ability of kids to see the range and experience the range and accept the range. Yeah. Okay, Gabe, you were trying to what were you gonna say there, Gabe? Yeah, no, Andy, I was just gonna add, I agree with everything Bob Bob says, but I think the one thing that I will add is there really is a need now more than ever to do long-term thinking. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. You know, it's so easy to fall into the trap of there's an immediate fire and I need to address it. And on a very real level, that's true. We need to address the current pandemic. We, we need to provide aid. We need to do, we need to act on what's happening now. Um, but you can't just act on the now. You, you really have to look long and figure out the long-term strategy and what is the source of clarity looking long? Because if not, you fall in, in, into this trap, into the cycle of constantly fighting fires every time they pop up. And you can either make the wrong, the wrong decision, uh, you know, in the present, or you can easily get burned out and lose hope and just say, y you know, I throw in the towel, I give up, or, um, you know, your congregation, your folks, your organization, your folks who rely on you um, for that can easily fall into that. And so, you know, as far as I can tell, the Institute for the Future is a world's own futures think tank. Um, we believe we, we are one of the uh, foremost authoritative voices on how to do futures thinking. We've moved away from just saying, come to us as the experts, to saying, come to us to learn how to do this. Um, because we feel that futures thinking is uh, becoming much more important. And we really want to equip people from all walks of life um, to be able to do this, not to find the right answer. Uh, we don't believe you can predict the future. We say if someone tells you they can predict the future, you shouldn't believe them. Um, you know, but what we want to do is we want to help people build resiliency. We want to help people think more creatively and imaginatively about what the future could hold and help us align ourselves better with, with the desired futures that we want. And I think exactly. I mean, we have, you know, there is a sense around how to cast a, you know, vision setting, for instance, is a very different thing. I would think, I think a vision, I visited with a, a, one of my predecessors the other day. We both 
ha, are very clear that vision plays an important role in leading an organization, but how he would have defined vision is very different from the way in which I think about vision and vision need around the kind of futurist thinking and having the capacity to have some clarity around some pieces uh, that are not clearly defined, but are kind of those lights that we head towards uh, mm -hmm. versus uh, if, it, if it's too defined, that's too close to us. <laughs> that won't drive us far enough, right? And then uh, being able to have that sense. In fact, we use uh, as our whole system of thinking in the diocesan office, and some of our churches are beginning to use attraction, which is that sense of kind of some of the big picture thinking around what it might look like, and then drawing back into some work that we could do now uh, right. to get us there. But that brings, so two last questions. One of my favorite questions, what are you reading and binging on TV? But you have to hold off. I've got one more before we get there. Work, we're all working from home. This is a massive shift. Uh, in the way in which we undertake work for organizations probably never thought they would do work this way. How is the meaning of work changing in this moment? What do you see that's really going to, you know, come out of this having moved us maybe five years ahead than what it would have taken to get there slowly?